It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me, particularly since um, I'm not known for sort of being kind of very close to the computational learning theory community, um, although I had personal connections to it. And a lot of the, th the stuff I'm gonna talk about today is things where learning theory is kind of difficult to apply to, and um, I'd like to sort of present this as a challenge for, for this community to, uh, to study it. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about learning representations or deep learning as it's come to be known. You can think of deep learning as one particular way of learning representations. Uh, so we know that uh, in the history of pattern recognition and machine learning, we've been uh, doing a pretty good job at uh, coming up with algorithms to learn classifiers and predictors of various kinds, uh, always assuming that either the feature set or the uh, kernel was given to us uh, beforehand. And um, the, the kind of questions I've been interested in for a very long time before, uh, you know, before, you know, from the first day I, I started working on machine learning, which was in the early 80s, um, uh, was learning representations. Because I think it was, I thought from the start that it was kind of the secret towards uh, sort of more powerful learning machines. And so that's why I sort of never had a huge interest for things like kernel methods and stuff like that, because they just were not solving the problems I was interested in. It doesn't mean that I don't think they're useful, um, but I think uh, my, my interest is just elsewhere. So here is where my interest is. It's um, um, learning, learning representations. And learning representations, um, I think, is, is probably the next step for, for AI, machine learning, as well as for things like neuroscience and cognitive science. Neuroscientists have no idea how the brain learns representations. And uh, I think uh, uh, machine learning can help them with that. So how do we learn representations of the, of the, of the world, say the visual uh, perceptual world, and um, by, by merely looking at the world, maybe acting on it as well? Um, neuroscientists ask themselves a similar question. How does the visual cortex organize itself to perceive, uh, you know, to turn itself into a visual cortex? Um, and um, the, the sort of connected question for, for machine learning would be how do we learn feature hierarchies? The reason for a hierarchy is, uh, is, is going to become clear in, a, in just a, a couple of minutes. So the deep learning problem really is the, the one of, uh, is one of, uh, you know, learning uh, uh, representations of the world by just looking at, uh, at data. Um, so traditionally, uh, as we all know, uh, pattern recognition systems have, have been built by either uh, building uh, handcrafted feature extractors followed by more or less generic classifiers. Although the more modern uh, approach to things like object recognition or speech recognition actually has another stage in it, uh, in the middle here. The low level features are fixed. In the case of speech, there are things like MFCCs. In the case of, of vision, there are things like SIFT and HOG. Uh, and the second level uh, actually uses learning. Usually it, uh, it's based on some sort of unsupervised learning, very simple one like k-means or sparse coding, uh, to sort of turn the low-level representations into sort of mid-level representations, you could call it this way. And then it's followed by some sort of pooling and, uh, and then a, a classifier, a supervised classifier. Uh, so, you know, one more stage, fixed, unsupervised learning, supervised training. That's kind of the mainstream approach to speech and, um, and image recognition until very recently. Um, but really, that model hasn't changed much since uh, the early days of pattern recognition. When you look at the perceptron, that's pretty much what it is. You know, a feature extraction uh, followed by some sort of classifier. And, um, uh, you know, maybe it's time after 50 or 55 years or so to uh, move away from that model. If we look at uh, uh, how the, the brain performs vision, and I'm not a huge advocate for, advocate for you know, getting inspired by biology, but, uh, but it's sometimes useful to get intuition from it. It's much more hierarchical. You have kind of a, uh, uh, for the sort of fast recognition process that uh, uh, people perform and, and you know, uh, animals as well, there's sort of a, uh, a feed-forward path that we can trace called the ventral uh, pathway in the cortex, visual cortex, that goes into several stages, each of which has, you know, very highly nonlinear operations, uh, 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 built in, and uh, it goes through you know various areas of the brain called V1, V2, V4, IT, each of which has kind of several layers of processing, if you want. So you might have to the signal might have to to go through maybe ten synapses or something like this, or ten 
uh, neurons, if you want, uh, to go to the uh, area of the brain where object categories are encoded. So it's not just, uh, it's not shadow in the, sen in the usual sense. It doesn't look very much like the kind of architecture that we've used so far. Okay, so uh, it, it's sometimes useful to get a little bit of inspiration from biology, but it's also very dangerous um, because we don't know what's important when we look at a piece of brain. We don't know what matters in it. And so uh, here is an example of what not to do. This is a guy called Clément Adair from the 19th century uh, who built uh, airplanes modeled after bats. And you know he didn't know much about aerodynamics. Uh, he was very good at building uh, steam engines but uh, powerful and light steam engines, but not very good at like, you know, stability and things like this. And so he built this airplane full size, and thing actually took off, uh, you know, flew 50 meters at one meter altitude, was completely uncontrollable, which is why you probably never heard of him. Uh, every Frenchman, of course, knows about him, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but not on this side of the pond. This side of the pond is the Wright brothers. Uh, this was 13 years before the Wright brothers. Um, so, you know, he got, he was too close to the biology. He really didn't know what was important about it. And um, he hadn't figured out completely you know, the law of aerodynamics and stability. And we might ask the question, you know, in our case, there are people in the world who got lots of money from uh, 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 various governments who claim that they can reproduce the uh, functions of the human brain by basically simulating a giant uh, brain on a computer. And I think it's completely nuts. I think it's just never. You know, it, it can't possibly work if we don't understand what the underlying principles are. So what are the underlying principles for intelligence? What is the equivalent aerodynamics of aerodynamics for intelligence, right? Um, that's, that's what uh, we might want to go after in terms of sort of conceptual uh, goals. Okay, so the architecture we might want to go after is something of this type where, you know, we feed a raw input and we have it go through a whole bunch of transformations, each of which is kind of a trainable machine, if you will. And, um, and as, as, as a side effect of this whole system uh, training itself to uh, perform the task, it will kind of drive internal representations uh, of the problem. So the first, if you're a theorist, at least some of the theorists I know, first question you might ask is, why do we need that many layers? Why can't we just do this with just two layers? Like say this, okay, have a control function, compare your input with all your training samples or a subset of them, compute a linear combination of this and you're done. Now, so of course, you know, someone has to give you this control function, which is just as complicated as coming up with a feature vector. Um, but, uh, uh, but the, you know, if you limit the complexity of this function here, uh, it's pretty clear that there is a whole bunch of functions here that will require a very, very large number of uh, terms in this sum to be able to do anything useful. Uh, or if the number of terms is small, that means your kernel function here does all the work, and where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? So there's kind of a, a bit of a conundrum here, and you know, you 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 would think that some functions that perceptual systems uh, have to compute are inherently sequential they require to have a certain number of sequential operations for them to be uh, uh, computable with sort of a relatively small amount of resources. Uh, there's a lot of complexity theorists in the room and people who have studied circuit complexity, I'm sure, uh, who know that uh, if you allow yourself to have a few layers of computations, uh, you can gain a, an exponential f uh, factor on the kind of amount of hardware you need to compute a particular function. For example, uh, let's say let's take the example of uh, you know uh, n bit parity. We know that we can do this with uh, you know log n stages or you know log, log n over two stages with XOR gates. Um, uh, but if we force ourselves to do it in two layers using the contracting normal form, we might need an exponential number of min terms. So the, you know it's just a, a very simple question of exchange of complexity between space and time, essentially, that we deal with all the time when we write programs. Um, if we allow ourselves multiple stages, then we might gain a huge factor on, on the overall uh, amount of resources we need. So, um, so it's, it's very intuitive. You know, I don't have any theorems to, tell you, to, to show you. You guys are the guys, are the people to actually prove those theorems. But the basic idea is, uh, basic, basic intuition of, of why we need multiple layers is, is just that. It's circuit complexity, basically. Um, Okay, so there's a, a, a bit of a theoretician nightmare here, which is that when we start having multiple layers in a system, like say a, a deep neural net, uh, and we try to train it using, say, supervised learning, we have 
loss functions that end up being non-convex. And if you have non-convex loss functions and you rely on things that, you know, like minimal, uh, like, you know, empirical risk minimization and stuff like that, you know, all those things go out the window because you can't prove anything about the optimality of your, of your model. Okay, but, you know, if they work, it's actually worth maybe spending the effort trying to figure out uh, why they work. So, um, um, so all bets are off with non-convex losses, but then again, you know, uh, Every speech system ever deployed has used non-convex optimization. Um, and it's not because they're non-convex that they don't work. Um, arguably, to some of us, the only interesting learning actually is non-convex. Because um, if you have a convex optimization to solve for learning, then the order in which uh, uh, you learn things doesn't matter. We know that humans... Uh, the, the order in which you learn things in humans matters. It's, it's called uh, pedagogy, right? Uh, I, can start, I, can, I can start my talk with the last slide and then go backwards, but I don't think you'll get in the same state at the end if I do this. So um, even though the, the aggregated statistics is the same. So, um, you know, there's the order in which uh, you see things actually matters and in which you learn things actually matters. And that suggests the fact that whatever loss function, you know, the human brain is minimizing, if it actually minimizes a loss function, which is another question, it has to be non-convex. Otherwise, the order in which we learn things wouldn't matter. Um, okay, that doesn't mean that we can't actually, uh, you know, do AI without convex optimization, but, um, but it's sort of an interesting observation, perhaps. Um, okay, the other theoretician nightmare is that, uh, you know, if... Uh, if we have all those things with deep learning algorithms, uh, we don't have any good gen generalization bounds. Well, actually, it's not true. You know, you take a big neural net, it actually has a bound, a VC bound type thing, because its VC dimension is finite, um, but no tight bounds. Now, that could be a problem, except that I don't actually know anybody in practice who uses bounds to do model selection. Um, I hate to say this in front of this crowd, but... Uh, uh, but that's true. Does anyone know? Does anyone know anyone who actually uses bounds in practice to do model selection, as opposed to say cross validation? Yeah. Raise your hands. We also don't use it. <laughs> okay, here you go. No hands. Okay, Leon, but I know I know it's not true. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you see, some of my best friends use bounds. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's hard to prove anything about deep learning systems, but then again, uh, if we only study models for which we can prove things, uh, we wouldn't have speech, handwriting, and object recognition systems today. Okay. Um, on the other hand, it's kind of a smorgasbord of, of stuff for theoreticians, because there are so many things we don't know about uh, all the methods that are used in deep learning, and I'll talk about them, some of them, as, as I go, uh, you know, during the talk. So. You know, deep learning is about representing uh, high dimensional data or representing data in high dimensional spaces. And there has to be interesting theoretical uh, questions about this. Uh, what's the geometry of natural signals? Um, you know, is there an equivalent of statistical learning theory for unsupervised learning or computational learning theory for that matter? I mean, I know there are efforts along those directions uh, uh, in this community. Uh, what are good criteria on which to base unsupervised learning? Things like that. Um, you know, questions that have been uh, answered by this community for supervised learning, which I think, you know, would be worth thinking about for uh, uh, teacher learning, which is sometimes unsupervised. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so let, let me talk about the state, of, the state of affairs for deep learning today. <clears throat> um, it's, it's been one of the hottest topics in speech recognition for about the last two years. The latest uh, generation of commercial systems that are based on, that do speech recognition, are all based on deep learning. Um, the ones from IBM, Google, Microsoft, um, are all based on deep learning. The ones in the iPhone, which is actually indirectly produced by uh, IBM through Nuance, they all use deep neural nets. And it's been a very, very fast transition from uh, Gaussian mixture models to deep neural nets for acoustic modeling in the last two years. Um, it's becoming the hottest topic in computer vision, mostly because of the last ImageNet competition. I'll come back to that. And uh, it's becoming a bit of an interesting topic for natural language processing, although it's not there yet. Um, 
And there's a, a huge interest from the applied math community into things like representing data in high dimensional spaces. Uh, people who used to do harmonic analysis who now do sparse coding and stuff like that. Um, okay, so um, here's another piece of history which kind of indicates in what, in what direction things are going. If you look at the history of handwriting recognition, speech recognition, now computer vision, object recognition, every time uh, there's been an increase in the number of training samples that were available, people started using learning more and more for more and more of the system. So instead of just learning the classifier, they would learn you know, the mid-level features and now the low-level features in, in an integrated fashion. And every time a step like this that was previously built by hand has been replaced by uh, a learning algorithm, essentially, performance has improved. Um, so we, we just saw this in speech recognition. It's just happening also in computer vision. And you know, it's been happening, it was happening uh, before that. It happened before that in handwriting recognition back in the 90s. So there's sort of a direct, a very clear sense of history. As our data sets go increase in size, as our machines become more powerful, we use learning more and more, and things become better as we replace more and more handcrafted modules in our system. It's a very clear path. Um, and um, so that's kind of a, you know, interesting thing to say for people interested in learning, you know, more, if you rely more on learning and less on human engineering, things work better if you have more data. Nothing revolutionary there, but you know, you have to kind of uh, realize that that's going on. Okay, so I'm going to talk about convolutional net uh, because, you know, everybody assumed that I'm going to talk about that. And um, also because they've become uh, very popular in recent uh, years for practical applications. And a number of companies have deployed uh, uh, image uh, recognition applications, some of them speech recognition applications based on, on convolutional nets in the last uh, year or so, last few months, in fact. So uh, convolutional nets uh, are inspired by uh, biology to some extent, uh, a little bit by the um, architecture, what we know about the architecture of the visual cortex. It has its root in the, the uh, Cognitron uh, model by Fukushima in the 70s which itself had its root in the work of Hubel and Wiesel, classic work in, in, uh, in neuroscience um, from the 60s, where basically the, the first couple stages of the visual system, the visual cortex, uh, are seen as filter banks. Okay, so you have uh, an input here or, or a bunch of planes of input, which might represent, say, color planes, for example, and then uh, uh, you have a bunch of planes here that extract uh, uh, features from the input using a, a convolution kernel, essentially. So you take a convolution kernel, swipe it over the image, you get, uh, so it's like a linear filtering, you get the result of the application of this uh, convolution to the input. And for different filters, you'll get different, in, different uh, outputs. Each of those is called a feature map. You pass that through some nonlinearity. The latest, most popular nonlinearity is called ReLU, Rectified Linear Unit. So it's basically a, a half rectification positive part, very simple nonlinearity. And then there is a second operation called pooling, which kind of aggregates the answers of the filters over a small region, sometimes over multiple features, and the resolution is reduced. That is to build a little bit of shift invariance and distortion invariance into the system. Uh, so this is sort of uh, you know pretty old uh, idea. The modern versions use uh, uh, what we call multiple stages, each of which has four layers or so, one that performs some sort of contrast normalization followed by this filter bank I was just telling you about, the nonlinear operation, this uh, rectified linear units I was telling you about, and then this feature pooling. And then you take this module, you stack multiple instances of it, uh, stick your favorite classifier on top. Uh, usually the whole thing is, uh, is trained with back, pro back propagation, just gradient descent, basically so a stochastic gradient descent, and you use backprop to compute the gradient of whatever loss function you want to minimize with respect to all the uh, coefficients in all the filters in uh, every layer. Um, the pooling operation is just any kind of symmetric operation, a max, an average, uh, a, you know, square root of sum of square or something of that type. Um, so um, let me give you, a, a, show you an old uh, animation of a convolutional net that was trained to recognize uh, handwritten characters. The reason I'm showing this to you is uh, because I, I, I'd like to point a property of feature extractors that I think is important. So this was trained entirely supervised to classify essentially endless digits, you can think of it this way, with a little bit of invariance to position. Now look at this particular pixel here. As the number three here goes up and down, it goes from white to black to white. I have a hard time keeping it fixed, but okay. So what that means is that 
the, the line formed by all the translated versions of this three is not flat. It's got a curvature because one of the coordinate goes from one value to another value back to the first value. So it's got to have some curvature to it. Now, the bad news is that, so if you imagine the set of all deformed trees, it's, it's a surface whose intrinsic dimension is the number of possible deformations you can do locally. Um, the similar manifold for digit eight um, is, is sort of entangled with the three. It's very highly nonlinear as well, but it's not linearly separable from the one of the threes. The, most of the pixels are common, uh, and, but the, the curvature of the two manifolds is very, very, uh, is, is very high. So you can't, you can't just do linear separation between them. You have to extract features, we know that. Okay, so look at, uh, if you look at any value that appears here on the top layer, there's hardly any that goes from white to black to white or vice versa. They go from you know, less gray to more gray or vice versa, whatever that means. Um, and what that means is that the manifold of stuff, uh, of, of, of deformed uh, uh, translated patterns here is kind of, is flatter. Um, because of all the process that went during training of this. Of course, uh, it happened to be this way because the, the layer that came after this was a linear classifier and linear classifiers like to have uh, linear subspace to separate from. So uh, that's precisely why it happened. But it's a good property to have for a feature, for a set of features that the, the manifold of variations you don't care about is flat. Uh, perhaps there is some idea on how to derive a proper um, criterion for unsupervised training based on this sort of flattening uh, manifold kind of idea. Uh, let me skip this. Can you trace the time? Okay, so there's a, a whole number of tasks for which we know that deep convolutional nets are the best method um, so far, the, for which we have the record. Handwriting recognition goes back a long time. OCR in natural images, traffic sign recognition, pedestrian detection, volumetric brain image segmentation, human action recognition, object recognition, scene parsing, scene parsing from depth images, speech recognition, breast cancer, cell mitosis detection. This was actually the Kaggle competition that was won very recently. Um, and um, all of those were won by purely supervised convolutional nets. Um, Okay, so things like you know traffic sign recognition, street number uh, is another application that we built on uh, EEG analysis. This is one from uh, Sebastian Son's group at MIT. Uh, this is a student Viren Jane for segmenting uh, brain tissue, where uh, he applies a convolutional net to a small volume of voxels and, and trains it to classify the central voxel as being the boundary between two cells or not. This is a, a piece of brain tissue, and after the network has produced uh, labels for each of the things. It can sort of reconstruct the, the, the brain circuit. Here is only showing a few percent of the neurons. They are very, very densely packed. Um, so it's a, a very interesting application uh, to connectomics. But here is really what uh, caused a big uh, commotion in the last few months. Back in October, uh, or a little earlier than this, uh, L.S. Krzyzewski, uh, Ilya Sutskever and Jeff Hinton won the uh, ImageNet 2012 competition. So this is one of the main competitions in computer vision for object recognition. And they won it by a huge margin. They got something like 15% error rate by some measure, uh, where all other methods that competed in the same competition got around 25-26% error. So it's, it's really a big jump. It's not just you know, a small improvement, it's a big jump. And it's essentially a big convolutional net. Um, using, uh, as Shai was saying, all the tricks I came up with in the last 20 years, plus uh, this dropout technique. But really what made this, uh, the secret of what made this successful is a very efficient implementation of this on GPUs, which allows, which allowed them to train on a very large data set of 1.3 million uh, training samples uh, in about a week uh, on a single GPU, or actually on two GPUs. Uh, the, the filters that are learned at the first layer are sort of somewhat interesting uh, the, the, the color and the black and white ones are separated for, it's kind of an artifact of the way that the system was designed. Uh, it works really well. Uh, here is another example. This was kind of a, a similar system that was developed at NYU, not by me, by uh, uh, Rob Fergus and uh, his uh, student Matt Zieler. And, and so they, they, they have a, a convolutional net that's somewhat similar to Alex Krzyzewski's, but uh, a little different. 
uh, also trained on, the, on ImageNet, uh, also using ReLUs, using contrast normalization at the layer. Uh, these are the filters at the first layer that are trained. Uh, it also uses this uh, draw path regularization, which is essentially a sort of very brutal regularization that consists in uh, killing half of the units in the top layers and hoping that the network will recover from it. And it's a different half that you kill at every sample. Um, I mean, you would think it's, you know, uh, murderous, but it seems to actually help a little bit. Um, it uses SGD, not a particularly um, sophisticated form of SGD. Uh, there is an online demo of this that you can play with, uh, a ratio that CS at NYU.edu. You can upload images and it will kind of uh, tag it with all the categories it finds. Uh, it works, you know, just as well as Alex uh, Kujewski's, a little better maybe, but I'm sure Alex has better versions now, but he's not going to talk about it, uh, not that he's at Google. And, um, but here is an interesting point about this, this network. The features that it learns are fairly generic. So if you, if you take the network that it trained on ImageNet, chop off the last layer, and then just retrain the last layer on a different data set, say Caltech 256, you basically get state-of-the-art performance with only six training samples per category. I think that's amazing. So Caltech 256 is not a particularly interesting set now. It's kind of out of date. But you know, the state-of-the-art is, is, is here. Previous state-of-the-art is here. You get to the state-of-the-art with six training samples per category just using the features at the output of this convolutional net. I mean, right before the output layer. Just retraining the classific classification layer. What that means is that the features it's learned are really generic. You can use them for just about any object recognition uh, task that you could, you could imagine. Um, uh, here's another uh, example. With, this is with the Pascal VOC challenge. So here, uh, it's not as uh, dramatic, but you know, the, the, the accuracy is pretty much state of the art, a little below, um, mostly because of the, the nature of the labeling of the Pascal VOC uh, data set. But it's, you know, it's kind of impressive because only the last linear classifier basically is, uh, is trained here on, on this data set. The features just come from ImageNet. Here's another example that was done in my lab uh, by uh, Clément Farabay and uh, Camille Coupri. This is for uh, labeling uh, uh, images. This is called the, the semantic labeling problem or, or scene parsing or there's various names for it. Um, and the problem here is to label every pixel in an image with the category of the object that it belongs to. Okay, so you know, sky, grass, and trees, and blah, blah, blah. And so it's a little more complicated than, than object recognition because you kind of have to figure out you know, where every pixel, what every pixel belongs to. And we just used a, uh, a convolutional net, but a multi-scale kind of convolutional net, where uh, you, uh, you take the, uh, the input, you build a pyramid out of it, uh, where you have kind of lower resolution versions of, those, of this image, and then you apply the same convolutional net uh, so let's say you want to classify the central voxel, here, the central pixel here. Uh, you apply a convolutional net that, whose uh, window, sort of context window, that is going to influence a particular output is say 46 by uh, 46 uh, pixel. If you apply the same convolutional net to this image, it will also get influenced by a 46 by 46 window. But now, the, since the image resolution is half, it's going to take into account uh, a, a context that's twice as big. Same here. So this guy is basically going to see the entire image at quarter resolution. And you combine the features that are uh, produced by the three copies of this convolutional net with the same, they all have the same filters, uh, concatenate them, feed them to a classifier, you train this whole thing supervised on a couple thousand labeled images that have been labeled at the pixel level. Um, and every decision for a particular pixel is, is gonna be taken into account this 46 by 46 window, and this, this 46 by 46 window, which really is 92 by 92 here, and this 46 by 46 window, which is really 184 by 184 here. So it can, it can use this huge context to make a decision. And this pretty much works at state of the art. So uh, the best result on this data set on the pixel per pixel accuracy basis is uh, 82%. Our system gets 81.4 instead of 81.9. We also have a simpler system that is uh, slightly lower by 1%, but is about 100 times faster uh, because it doesn't use any kind of complex graphical model as post-processing. It uses a very, very simple post-processing after the uh, convolutional net. This is on the uh, Stanford background data set that has eight categories. This is the CFLOW data set, or oh, I should have mentioned, the two measures of performance. This is pixel accuracy, and this is pixel accuracy where an error counts for more if it concerns uh, a category that's rare, so that uh, 
you know, you pay more for missing a human, even if it's uh, only a few pixels in a large image. Um, so it's, you know, it's a more accurate measure. On, on this one, we actually beat, uh, beat everyone. Um, uh, this is on a C-flow data set with 33 categories. Uh, then again, uh, we pretty much have the, the record here. Depending on how we train it, we can beat the record either on pixel accuracy or on, on class normalized pixel accuracy. And this is a data set with 170 categories where nobody does well. And we do just less badly than, uh, you know, Lana Zednik. This is Lana Zednik's uh, group at uh, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. Um, so here are some examples of results. This works really, uh, really well. Uh, this is the 33 categories, got trees and buildings and windows and roads and everything, sky, sand. Um, and you'll see an uh, example of, a, of a, uh, a video here. So each frame here is processed independently, um, which means there's no sort of uh, temporal consistency here. And it makes some stupid mistakes like, you know, when, when the, when the ground is bright, it's classified as sand. Uh, this is actually Greenwich Village, so I can tell you there's no sand. There's no beach. Um, and so this is someone riding a bike with a uh, panoramic camera. Uh, has been, the pictures have been stitched together. Um, but it gets most of the important objects, like humans, I mean people, and you know trees and stuff like that. Modular lighting problems. How much speed is FPGA giving you over CPU? So a CPU, so on a, on a sort of beefy Mac laptop, this runs at about two frames per second. Uh, the GPA, if, if we um, run entirely on the FPGA, it would run at about uh, 20 frames per second, except that the communication with the FPGA board is actually slow, so the system time is actually slower. Uh, here's another. Another example, this uses uh, uh, temporal consistency. It's kind of a similar video, has fewer categories, but it's the same video. Uh, and there's a lot less kind of jumping around of categories here because of this consistency over time. It's just a post-processing, there's no change to the, the conventional net. You can apply this also to images that uh, have depth uh, information with them, so collected with the Kinect indoor uh, data. And again, this uh, has the best results uh, that we know of. Uh, and this is without uh, temporal consistency and with uh, temporal consistency. Okay, so enough for supervised stuff. Let's talk about unsupervised learning. So how do we uh, devise unsupervised learning algorithms that will allow us to pre-train the layers of, say, a convolutional net or any kind of uh, uh, deep learning system hierarchical feature extractor um, using unlabeled data? Because, of course, we have a lot more unlabeled data than we have labeled data. Now, it used to be that all of deep learning all of what deep learning was about was this. And there was kind of a minor side interest in things like convolutional nets, which uh, seem to work just fine if you just train them supervised, as long as you have enough data. And because of the, uh, uh, import, you know, because of the fact that we now have large data sets, large label data sets, uh, there's sort of slightly less interest in this kind of unsupervised learning things, because the supervised stuff works so well. Um, so even people like Jeff Hinton, who kind of were really, really interested in this unsupervised learning stuff, uh, essentially for practical purpose, is just doing supervised convolutional nets now. He actually calls them dread nets, which stands for deep uh, rectified uh, uh, networks with dropout. D e r d d r e d right. Um, Okay, so how do we do unsupervised learning? So, you know, there's this hypothesis that the manifold of natural data, if you take patches from natural images, the set of possible patches you will observe is actually a low-dimensional subspace uh, of all possible combinations of pixels you could come up with, right? Um, so there is this, you know, uh, picture of sort of the, the manifold um, assumption. And some people don't agree with this. People like Stefan Mala say that's kind of a wrong picture to think about. Uh, I, th I think I agree with him, but it's, but it's still useful. Um, so <clears throat> what we'd like to do is, uh, you know, turn ideally what an ideal feature extractor should do is uh, take a bunch of, of samples, data points, and tell you if there is a manifold of data, tell you where you are in the manifold, 
with a number of components, and then have a separate set of components that tell you the uh, distance to the manifold in the, all the other dimensions in the ambient space. Okay? So what you really want is you want to kind of factor two sets of, of, of variables. One is where you are in the manifold, and the other one is where you are away from the manifold. Okay, so if you had, for example, the set of manifold of uh, possible faces, all human faces, it's high dimensional manifold. Um, for a, a particular person, it's bounded by the number of muscles in your face and the number of you know, degrees of freedom that you can move around, which is six. And then if you include everybody, then there is some sort of you know, number of dimensions uh, basically bounded by the genome of you know, how many different faces you can have, uh, modulo accidents. Um, and, um, and so, you know, if we had this manifold, then, if, and if we had this kind of uh, feature separation, you could use the first part to tell who you're looking at and what expression they're making, and you could use the second half, the part that tells you, you know, how far away you are from the manifold to tell you if it's a face or not, or if it's something else. So, you know, Disentangling the explanatory factors of variation is really what unsupervised learning should be about. There is a general idea, which is sort of emerging a little bit. There is no kind of concrete uh, or theoretical justification for it, but it's just what people end up doing in the end, uh, which is that a feature extractor should really be composed of two steps. A nonlinear step that basically embeds the input into a very high dimensional space or high dimensional space. Okay, this is similar to the kind of kernel kind of thing, right? You embed things into a high dimensional space so that things are more easily separable in that space. Same stuff, except, you know, not based on the kernel trick, based on other things. It has to be nonlinear because if it's linear, it doesn't do anything useful for you. It's like a no-op. Okay, so embed your input into a high dimensional space in some sort of nonlinear way. But then what you do here is that you're breaking the, spa the, the space apart. There are things that are semantically similar or even identical that will end up in different bins. Uh, in this representation, maybe very far apart. So the second step, uh, which is sort of a generalized pooling, similar to the pooling we do in convolutional nets, is to regroup the things uh, here that are supposed to be similar. Okay, so whenever uh, uh, you get two vectors here that represent two faces and they happen to be very different, uh, you somehow encode them uh, in such a way that here they end up being similar. And then this linear? It may or may not be linear. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't pick up. Oh, you were, okay. Probably not. Probably. No. Uh, what people do in practice is something like uh, um, like L2. So square root of some of squares of some components, subset of components. Can it be sort of a sum, picking some landmarks and just representing every object as the vector distances from those landmarks? Yeah, right. Okay, so here is an example for, very concrete example for the, the sort of mainstream approach to computer vision until convolutional nets, right? So the Lezednik uh, PRV mesh kernel SVM, for example. Okay, well, so for mid-level features, what you do here is k-means. So you, you take, say, a sieve vector, you run it through a k-means algorithm, and the k-means is going to give you a binary vector with all zeros but and one one at the location of the prototype that's closest to the input, okay? So it's just a winner-take-all kind of encoding, if you want, a, a, a word, right, a visual word. And the pooling here takes all of those feature vectors for the entire image and just average them, or you know, combines them in some way. So now what you get is a histogram of words, and you can feed that to your favorite classifier. And the, the, the goal of this is to basically uh, give you a shift invariance. So once you do this aggregation, the position of a feature doesn't matter anymore. It's just the presence of it that matters. Okay, so you've regrouped things that were, you know, Dissimilar. Now it turns out when you do something like sparse coding here, it works much better than if you do k-means because sparse coding uh, preserves a bit of, of a similarity between things, right? Uh, which k-means just completely uh, explodes. Okay, so we have this manifold picture. We have a bunch of data points, and what we'd like is to kind of learn a function that gives us the dependency between x1 and x2 here in this case. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to, the, the sort of general framework I think that is the most appropriate for this is uh, the sort of energy-based uh, framework, which consists in essentially learning an energy function, or think of it as a contrast function that tells you if I give you a point, and the contrast function gives you a scalar that tells you whether you are on the manifold or not on the manifold. And if the function is, is able to do this, internally it has to be able to, to kind of 
do this disentangling of features, right? It has to be able to tell uh, in which direction the manifold is, you know, what's the closest point on the manifold, and you know, where am I going on the manifold, and things like this, right? So that's all we're going to do. We're going to uh, train a system to produce a single scalar, and the scalar is going to be some sort of contrast function that tells you how far away we are from the manifold of data. So let's say we take uh, samples coming from the spiral here, and we run PCA, so PCA with only one dimension. So it's a two, a two input problem, two output problem, and we do PCA with one uh, principal component. PCA will find a, uh, this main axis here of the point cloud, and uh, the, the, the reconstruction error would be zero for anything that's on the principal axis, and will grow quadratically as we move away from it. Uh, if you use sparse coding, uh, you know, it will sort of wrap up the, the set of, of points into a, a kind of union of, of planes, if you want, or union of uh, lines, so that the sum of the distance to all the lines uh, end, ends up being uh, the function we're, we're looking for. Uh, K-means will just put a whole bunch of prototypes all around the surface. Uh, this seems perfect, but it doesn't work in high dimension, of course. Okay, so let's concentrate on this idea of sparse coding. Um, so sparse coding is, uses this, an energy function of this type, uh, which has two arguments. One is the input, and the other one is a, a code vector, which is really a latent variable that we're going to infer. And the energy function uh, is the square reconstruction error, where we multiply the code vector by some matrix, called the dictionary matrix, and then we add a regularization term, which is the sum of the absolute values of the components of the, of the code. If we know the dictionary matrix, uh, given a y, we find a z here that minimizes this uh, energy function, and that gives us our feature vector. It's going to be high dimensional, high dimensional and sparse. Okay? So it has, and it's, it's a nonlinear mapping. The one that maps y to the optimal z is nonlinear mapping. Um, but it's slow to compute, because you have to do this argmin operation. Uh, we can learn the dictionary matrix, of course, with uh, Olsa and Field uh, told us how to do this a very long time ago, uh, using just SGD, basically, just uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, to minimize this over, the overall average energy of uh, a collection of samples, training samples. Uh, the columns of W have to be normalized for this to work. Um, and the, the manifold assumption that's hidden behind the sparse coding is basically that the data is, uh, fits sort of a union of low dimensional planes, where the dimension of each plane corresponds to the number of components in Z that are non-zero once we do this minimization. Um, so, in general, though, we have several ways of designing unsupervised running algorithms. One is, uh, number one is to construct the energy function so that the volume of stuff that takes low energy uh, is fixed. Because the problem we have is that we have to build this energy function so that it has low energy on the points, on the data points, on the manifold, but higher energy everywhere else. And it's easy enough to tweak the parameters of an energy function to take low values on the points. Okay, just do a gradient descent. But then how do you make sure the energy is high everywhere else? And that's basically, it's basically the, the uh, partition function problem in, you know, that people have been hitting in uh, graphical models and stuff like that. It's very similar in spirit. So you want to construct you, one method, one strategy is construct the energy so that the volume of low energy stuff is fixed. So that if you give low energy to some points, the other points will automatically have higher energy. PCA is one of those, K-means is one of those. The uh, second strategy is to push down on the energy of the samples and push up on the energy of everything else. This is a strategy used by contrasted divergence, which is used to train restricted Boltzmann machines. Uh, this is also a strategy used by maximum likelihood when you have a log partition function as a contrastive term that pushes up on the energy of other stuff. But it's very expensive to do if your partition function is not uh, tractable um, or doesn't have a tractable gradient. So you have to use Mon Monte Carlo methods and stuff. Um, and the third one is to use a regularizer to limit the volume of stuff that can take low energy. So basically, build your model in such a way that it has a regularizer, and by minimizing this regularizer, it sort of shrink wraps the, uh, vo the stuff of low energy into sort of a, a, sm in a small volume, if you want. And that's basically what sparse coding does. The, sparse, the sparsity term uh, limits the volume of stuff that is allowed to take low energy. That's essentially what it does. Okay, so the sparse coding uh, method is uh, what we call the decoder only method that goes from, has a simple function to compute that goes from the code to the input, uh, which means you have to run an optimization algorithm to figure out the optimal code for a given input. So what we're gonna do is we're going to add to this a sort of a feed forward function that goes from the input to the code and we'll, we'll attempt to predict 
what the optimal code is. And this function would necessarily have to be nonlinear. Um, in the case of sparse coding, we call this PSD, which means predictive sparse decomposition. Uh, we could give you know, various uh, uh, architectures for this, uh, let's say a, a simple neural net of some kind. Um, and so here is uh, the algorithm running, this PSD algorithm running on uh, a set of natural image patches. And what I'm representing here are each square here is a column of the WE matrix represented as, uh, as an image of the same size as the input. So you get, uh, in the end of the training, you get sort of oriented Gabor detect detectors, which is what you're ex what's more or less expected. Um, now, to, to design this encoder, uh, this G function, uh, a former postdoc of mine, Carl Greger, has this really brilliant idea of essentially emulating an algorithm that we know will produce the optimal Z called FISTA or ISTA, Iterative Shrinkage and Thresholding Algorithm. Uh, and the ISTA algorithm basically is this kind of iteration where you, you take the input, you multiply it by an encoding matrix, and then you pass it through a shrinkage, a shrinkage function, each component, multiply it by a square matrix, which is you can think of as a lateral inhibition matrix, add it to the pre previous result you had, and iterate this loop. So it's kind of this uh, recurrence here. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to learn, uh, instead of using uh, uh, you know, this definition for S, and that definition for WE, we're just going to learn S and WE. And so you can think of this as a recurrent neural net of some kind with two matrices WE and S. And we're going to train this recurrent neural net, which has a bounded complexity, to do the best approximation it can of the optimal sparse code. And this works really well. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the result. Uh, just to say that we've applied this to kind of various things, including one where we have criteria that combine this reconstruction, the sparsity, as well as the, uh, a, a sort of prediction. And this was a recent paper by uh, Jason Rolf uh, and myself at ICLE, the ICLE conference. And uh, this produces very interesting results that we've never seen before in, uh, in, uh, in neural nets for, for recognition, uh, in which uh, inputs are kind of decomposed into sort of, uh, a sort of a prototype, if you want, plus a whole bunch of little modifiers of this prototype that turn the prototype into the observed input. I don't have time to go into the details. Uh, but I can tell you more about this later if you want, if you're interested. Um, another uh, version of this uses uh, convolution. So instead of using sparse coding as a linear, uh, uh, just a matrix, we view it as a, a bunch of convolutions applied to feature maps to reconstruct the input. And um, also use this PSD algorithm. And the result of this, for various reasons that I'm not going to uh, explain too much, is that we get much more diverse filters, largely because the system is trained now at the image level and doesn't need to learn translated versions of all the filters. And so it uh, ends up having more uh, resources to spend on learning very diverse filters like center surround, crosses and corners and uh, gratings of various kinds. So you get much more diverse filters doing this than you, you would get with standard uh, patch-based sparse coding. Uh, same, that's another example here as we increase the number of, number of filters. OK, so how do we, how do we use this to train to pre-train a convolutional net? We, uh, we take one of those PSD sparse autoencoder. This is really a sparse autoencoder uh, in, in the convolutional form to pre-train the filters of a convolutional net. And so wrapped into this encoder, we have the input, the filter bank, and the nonlinearity. And the pooling really resides in the, in the next stage. And once we're happy with it, we, uh, we, we get rid of the decoder. We, fr we uh, just run through the encoder, uh, run our training set through this, and then stick a second stage of that, train this, unsupervised, then get rid of the feedback again, just keep the feedforward path, stick a classifier on top, and now what we have is a full uh, convolutional net that we can train supervised, but it's been pre-trained to essentially carry as much information as possible about the input all the way to the output. And so we start from, from, from a pretty good place. So it turns out this really helps in situations where the task you're trying to learn is very, is very poor in terms of the diversity of labels that you have. Uh, but for a big data set like ImageNet, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference, perhaps in speed of learning. We, we're still exploring this. We really don't know. But on things like pedestrian detection, so pedestrian detection is a case where you have lots of images, they're very diverse. Uh, the background category has a huge amount of uh, variability in it, but you only have two labels. It's either a pedestrian or not. 
And if you train a convolutional net to do this, the features you get at the top layer are really bad because the, you know, the label doesn't give you any information really about what's in the image. It only gives you one bit of information. So using this pre-training actually helps the feature be more kind of generic if you want. And it actually makes a difference in performance. So uh, this is a false uh, negative versus false positive rate. So this is the uh, false positive per image. This is uh, one false positive per image right here. And this is the miss rate. And all of those curves are from all kinds of systems published in literature. This is a convolutional net that's been trained purely supervised. And this is the same one that's been pre-trained with this unsupervised training. Uh, and then refined supervised. So it makes quite a big difference. It goes from you know, middle of the pack to basically record holder for this data set. This is the, uh, the uh, INRIA data set. This is the kind of filters you get after training. And that's a video of the system in action. Uh, There's an important point I have to make, uh, which is that it's very easy to turn a, a localized recognizer or detector uh, that is a convolutional net into a, into a full-fledged detector on a full image. It's very cheap to do this. Um, it's a point that a lot of people miss, but it's, it's really the case. Here's another example. This is in front of our lab. Here we kind of lowered the threshold so that we get uh, some of the false positives to see what they look like. Uh, there are a few. Um, so there are various forms of this for sort of invariant uh, recognition where you, we build the, the pooling inside of this regularizer uh, for things like that, uh, where, we, where we can organize the features into topographic map and do a group sparsity on groups that overlap each other. And the system organizes itself so that features that fire together end up being in the same groups. And so you get this sort of nice looking topographic maps which basically are not particularly interesting for people like us uh, in machine learning and computer vision, but they really kind of uh, resonate with our friends in neuroscience. Um, and you know, they produce nice colored pictures, which I'm showing to you without explaining. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna go any further than that, um, and because I'm out of time, and um, I'd like to, uh, mentioned sort of a few issues I think that are of a somewhat theoretical nature that we really don't understand about deep learning. The first one is what is the nature of the loss function that we're minimizing with deep learning? It's kind of a practical problem, a practical optimization problem if you will. Uh, essentially when you train a deep neural net, the cost function has lots and lots of saddle points. It's not just the local minima that are annoying, it's the saddle points. Uh, because there's a big issue of breaking symmetries, you know, deciding if one unit should do something and the other unit should do something complementary or if it should be the other way around. So the symmetry breaking issues, which are the, which are the issues that limit the speed of, of training. Convolutional nets traditionally haven't been victim of this, which is why they've been uh, uh, one of the few very deep neural nets that have been in use for a long time. It's because they don't have that symmetry breaking problem to the same extent, they, they, have, they have it, but not to the same extent. So it's kind of one issue. Um, Another uh, set of issue is, um, is something we didn't understand 20 years ago, is that the systems that seem to work best are the ones that are ridiculously over-parameterized. Uh, we make the networks bigger and they just work better even if we have limited amounts of data. Um, and what we have to do is just uh, regularize the hell out of, the, out of them using things like dropout and things of that type. Um, but even if we don't regularize them, they work surprisingly well and we don't understand why. The effective VC dimension of those things is much lower than what we think. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> then I think the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, issue, I think, is how do we uh, formalize unsupervised learning? What, what really is a good criterion for training an unsupervised system? It's always been a, a problem of mine to figure out, you know, how do you even test if an unsupervised learning system works, right? What's the criterion? And the criterion is, you know, train it to extract features and then train a classifier on the features and see if it works, right? That, at least that's an objective criterion. But it's not a good criterion to use for training unsupervised because you're not allowed to use the labels. So uh, how do we design loss functions for unsupervised learning? How do we, uh, and what are the principles on which it would be based? So this energy-based stuff uh, is a little more general than the usual sort of maximum likelihood uh, uh, formulations, probabilistic formulations, but, you know, maybe it's not the right one. Thank you very much.